Hi everybody. So I concluded the last chapter, but there's an afterword that I wanted to read to you that kind of goes into the history of what happened to Jamestown during that winter, because it's a really famous time period. Now all of us at Jamestown, beginning to feel that sharp prick of hunger, which no man truly described, but he which hath tasted the bitterness thereof. All was fish that came to net to satisfy cruel hunger, as to eat boots, shoes, or any other leather some could come by. And now, famine beginning to look ghastly and pale in every face that nothing was spared to maintain life, and to do those things which seem incredible, as to dig up dead corpse out of graves and to eat them. George Percy, a true relation of the proceedings and occurrence. During the winter of 1609 to 1610, the settlers at Point Comfort did not go hungry. They had enough extra fish and crabs that even their hogs were well fed. As winter set in, ice formed on the river and travel between Jamestown and Point Comfort became impossible. It was not until spring that those at Point Comfort found out about the horror that befell Jamestown that winter. Chief Powhatan ordered his tribes to stop trading with the settlers at Jamestown. The natives also went to Hog Island, which the settlers had stocked with hundreds of hogs, and slaughtered them all. Then they went back to killing any settler they found outside the fort. Settlers were afraid to hunt and fish, so they remained inside the palisades. When the stores ran out and they'd eaten the last of their sheep and goats, they ate even the laying hens. As things got worse, they ate their horses, dogs, and cats, and then any rat, mouse, or snake they could catch. When there was nothing left to kill, they even ate their starched collars, their leather shoes, anything that could be chewed and swallowed. Men, women, and children starved and died. Hunger caused desperation. Some of the colonists began to dig up the dead bodies and eat them. One group of men escaped that terrible winter by using violence to secure a large quantity of food from one of the native tribes and then stealing one of the ships and sailing back to England. The remaining settlers were ravaged by disease, starvation, and warfare with the Indians. Out of the roughly 500 settlers Captain Smith said were in Jamestown when he left, by spring only 60 settlers remained, all of them close to death. The winter of 1609 to 1610 became known as the Starving Time. Chief Powhatan had tried again to wipe out the tribe that came from the Chesapeake, and he had nearly succeeded. In the spring of 1610, the man who was to be Jamestown's new governor in 1609, Sir Thomas Gates, finally arrived. He had been shipwrecked on Bermuda for nine months until new ships could be built from the remains of the sea venture. When Gates saw the desperate conditions in Jamestown, he decided to abandon the settlement and take the remaining survivors back to England. But as they sailed down the river, heading home, they were met by a messenger carrying a letter. It said that Sir Thomas West, Lord de la Warre, the new Lord Governor and Captain General of Jamestown, was on his way up the river to Jamestown with three ships, over 150 new colonists, and food for a year. The message was clear, go back to Jamestown. Reluctantly, the settlers returned to try again. The next several years were difficult ones. Jamestown's new leaders took revenge on the natives, even the Cocottons and the Wereskiaks, who had helped the settlers so much. They slaughtered native men, women, and even children from many tribes. Revenge bred revenge, and there were raids and killings on both sides. In 1613, Pocahontas was kidnapped by the settlers and held hostage. In return for her freedom, they demanded that her father free the English prisoners he was holding, give back stolen English weapons and tools, and send a large quantity of corn. Chief Powhatan gave the settlers some of what they asked for, saying he would send the rest when his daughter was returned to him. The English said this was not enough. Chief Powhatan refused to give in to the hostage taker's demands, and Pocahontas remained a prisoner. John Rolfe, a new colonist, began growing tobacco in Jamestown. Tobacco grew well in Virginia and sold well in England, and finally there was hope that the colony would make a profit for the Virginia Company of London. 
While she was held prisoner, Pocahontas met John Rolfe. The two were married in 1614 with Chief Powhatan's blessing. This began a period of time some historians call the Peace of Pocahontas. For a while, there was not as much bloodshed between the English and the natives, and the two groups shared the land together. Pocahontas, her husband John Rolfe, and their son Thomas were taken to England by Sir Thomas Dale to promote the Jamestown colony and help Dale get financial assistance. There, she became ill and died in 1617. She was buried at St. George's Parish Church in Gravesend, England. In 1619, the first Africans arrived in the Virginia colony on a privateering ship. It's not clear whether they were slaves or indentured servants, which means they would have to work for a number of years and then they would be free. But soon, especially with so much labor needed for the tobacco fields, Africans were brought to Virginia and sold as slaves for life. Was Reverend Hunt's prediction right? Did Samuel become something much greater than a servant? Yes. In 1619, the Virginia Company of London created the House of Burgesses in Virginia. By that time, there were 11 settlements, and each settlement had its own leadership. Samuel Collier, by then a grown man, was recognized for his knowledge, skills, and ability to communicate with the natives in their own language. Captain Smith wrote that Samuel was appointed leader of a town. Captain John Smith was never able to return to Jamestown, but his writings are one of our most valuable records of what went on in the colony. Did the Powhatan prophecy ever reach its conclusion? In 1622, though, Chief Powhatan had died. His empire was still strong, led by his brother, Opankaka, but there were still many more natives than Europeans living in Virginia. But more settlers arrived on ships from England every couple of months, and they were taking over more and more of the land the Indians used for hunting and planting. Chief Opankaka decided to wipe out the English once and for all. He carefully planned his attack. On March 22, 1622, 347 colonists were killed, about one-third of the Virginia European population. The settlers began raiding the Indian villages, killing and burning, with the goal of exterminating the native people. War between the natives and the Europeans continued for years. Chief Opankaka did mount one more large attack on the settlers in 1644, but by then, the European population had grown and the Indian population had been decimated. Chief Opankaka was captured and killed, and the Powhatan Empire crumbled, just as the prophecy had predicted. The Powhatan Empire was destroyed by a new tribe that arrived from the Chesapeake Bay. During the first hundred years after the English arrived in 1607, over 90% of Virginia's native population was killed, either in warfare and massacres, or by the new diseases the Europeans brought with them. As Europeans took over more and more of their land, the natives were forced onto reservations. And then over time, most of their reservation land was taken from them. There is, however, land in the Virginia countryside that for thousands of years has been home to the native peoples who still live there. If you really enjoyed that story, like I did, there is a follow-up story um, that she wrote, which I'm going to read next. I'll read the first chapter of, and it is about Virginia, the baby Virginia, and she's a child in the colony now. Thanks for listening.